huge uh, pleasure to welcome our speaker tonight. This is the last in our series of lectures on the interface really between humanities and other subjects, uh, social sciences and hard sciences. And um, uh, it's a wonderful way to end. We have uh, Adeline um, Buckland from, from King's College London, who teaches uh, Victorian uh, literature um, in the Department of English at King's, and who is uh, really um, everything that we could want in a speaker in this series who, who researches <laughs> English <laughs> literature. Um, uh, uh, perhaps what I might call uh, uh, realistic English literature, is that or English literature, which has um, engaged, uh, especially in the Victorian period, of course, with, um, uh, with uh, sciences such as uh, uh, geology and also with uh, raw materials. Um, so, uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I think, do, do I need to stand up to see you? Okay, that's fine. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk to you today about a, a paper that I'm in the process of writing, um, and that's a response partly to my first book, uh, Novel Science, which was on geology and literature in the Victorian period, uh, but which some of the reviews uh, mentioned in relation to this new idea about the anthropocene. And um, I haven't thought about it in those terms at all. So this is partly my attempt to kind of work through that other research in relation to this newer, much trendier thing that I'm usually um, associated with. Um, so, so I'm really pleased to have a chance to present it to you. So thank you for having me. Uh, at the 35th International Geological Congress held in South Africa in 2016, the Anthropocene Working Group, a group of geologists, presented its eagerly awaited evidence that the Earth has now entered the Anthropocene epoch, a subdivision of the longer quaternary period of the planet's history. Is a, um, so it's right at the top with the cars on top. <laughs> it's very, very thin, very recent uh, part of the Earth's history. The group argued that human beings now constitute a force of nature on a geological scale, fundamentally restructuring Earth systems to the extent that even if all anthropogenic forcings, they said, of the climate cease tomorrow, the defining characteristics of the present stratigraphic signal would continue to be detectable in geological strata. So even if the humans and the uh, cars vanished, the strata would continue now to register the impacts of human life on Earth. Um, and all over the earth. So it's not the fact that humans are currently the main driving force of change that's the most significant factor in the naming of this new geological epoch, they continued, but the scale, nature, pace and novelty of human impact. So in other words, it's the grandeur of the change that matters. The stratigraphic record has been set on an irreversible trajectory, they write, marked by important events on the planetary scale. The struggle to apprehend the scale of the environmental disaster zone, that's now the Earth, um, to make sense of it in the equally vast geological time scale that constitutes the Earth's history is a frequent refrain in Anthropocene discourse. So Jeremy Davies, recent, in his recent book, writes, for instance, it's hard to grasp the scale of the modern environmental crisis to imagine the vast expanses of history that put modern climatological events in appropriate context. So he writes, it could have been 30 million years ago that the Earth was so warm and held so much carbon. It could have been 300,000. It's easy to forget. I'm sure geologists don't forget, but um, in general. In a different sense, Rob Nixon has dramatised the ways in which the effects of myriad small, bad ecological choices are rarely felt in the times and places in which they're perpetrated or by the people and institutions who have perpetrated them. How can we imaginatively render visible vast force fields of interconnectedness, he asks, against the attenuating effects of temporal and geographical distance? Dupesh Chakrabarti, in another vein, has famously suggested that to call human beings geological agents is to scale up our imagination of the human. But it's also to scale down the significance of the human in an Earth history that exceeds by some distance and is presumed to, that it will outlive our species. This radical recontextualization of human agency across geological time and planetary space is no easy imaginative task, and that's about the only thing that all the authors agree on. So in this paper, I'm going to go back to the 1830s, um, to another decade in which geologists would, like the AWG, ask the public to reimagine the relationship between human and geological timescales 
in ways that would profoundly alter the idea of what it meant to be human and to live upon the earth. In particular, I'm going to consider the role that geologists like Charles Lyell and Charles Darwin attributed to the human imagination and its ability to apprehend vast swathes of geological time and space. The legacies of this effort, I'm going to argue, continue to haunt Anthropocene discourse in the 21st century. So in the writings of these influential men, the grand powers of the geological imagination are defined specifically by contrast with a racist view of the imaginative inferiority of indigenous peoples. How could human beings rightly imagine a world that was so many millions of years older than their species? How could imagining at such a scale ever be made reliable? The answer for Lyle and Darwin and, and people like them lay partly in the differentiation between those white, educated, European, usually male human beings defined as possessing an almost superhuman imaginative power and the non-white peoples who supposedly lacked it. As such, the geological imagination, requiring as it did an insight into worlds beyond human observation, was built upon, even required, a sense of struggle to see non-white peoples as human at all. And that's what I'm going to kind of state, hopefully, in this paper. So we're going to begin with Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology. Very, he's often described as the father of modern geology, and this is the text with which he supposedly um, brought geology into kind of modern being. It's not quite true, but it's true enough for now. Um, and he's, Charles Lyell's particularly concerned with the definition of the human that would emerge from wider appreciation of the sheer immensity of the geological time scale. So Lyell, throughout his career, and especially in this book, argued passionately against an emerging geological consensus that the Earth had undergone a history of progress. So the Earth had begun with a kind of fiery, volatile beginning in which lots of geological disasters occurred and built the world, and had slowly cooled to become this richly balanced, geologically stable world fit for human habitation. So it started off this place of grand geological kind of activity and had slowly cooled, and as it had done so, more and more complex forms of life had been introduced into the Earth, culminating in human beings. That was a kind of consensus that was emerging around, among geologists of the 1820s. He thought that consensus was anthropomorphic, and in being so, belied a peculiarly primitive form of the imagination at work in the minds of his geological contemporaries. So instead, Lyle argued that imagining the Earth at a scale of millions of years, which everyone was doing, but he thought they weren't doing it properly, meant acknowledging that the rock and fossil record bequeathed by the deep past was not almost complete, as many believed, and as these types of images can sometimes lead you to believe, as if, you know, as if there is a kind of complete history, and sometimes these are imagined as books or chapters in Earth history. And he said, they are books and chapters in Earth history, but nearly all of the chapters have been torn out, and we've got a couple of pages here, there, and everywhere, but almost nothing remains. And so you can't tell a story of progress, because you just don't have enough evidence to construct a reliable narrative at all. So he said the likelihood of the fossilisation of any species, particularly of land animals, was really low. Um, the effects of pressure and metamorphosis and the redistribution of land and sea across millennia had completely destroyed the Earth's archive, if you like, of rocks and fossils. So human beings were in a particularly difficult position as observers of geology because they were both latecomers to an Earth that preceded them by millions of years, and they lived on the Earth's surface where only a fraction of geological events occurred and where only a fraction of geological deposits were located. So importantly, Lyle argued that while his fellow geologists might profess to know that the Earth was of high antiquity, that it was old, they didn't really know it. They hadn't thought it through. They'd been too easily seduced by the evidence of their senses, the evidence presented by the strata which they had assumed was almost complete. So they hadn't imagined it at an appropriate scale or considered the possibility that wholesale geological change might happen over time scales so long as to be imperceptible to the human eye. Failing to adequately account for the invisible, imperceptible dimensions of Earth history, theirs, he suggested, was the kind of imagination that belonged to, quote, human beings in an early stage of advancement. They'd given in to their senses. They thought that the rocks and fossils told them everything. But Lyle had a solution to this problem, and it was not to do away with the imagination altogether, but to redefine it. So Lyle contended that the rightly trained, God-given human imagination was still the agent by which such obstacles might be overcome. 
There was no story of progress in the rocks, but the human mind itself had progressed over millennia to achieve the rational and imaginative prowess required to envision the world aright. So he put it in uh, Principles of Geology. Although we are mere sojourners on the surface of the planet, chained to a mere point in space, enduring but for a moment of time, the human mind is not only enabled to number worlds beyond the unassisted ken of mortal eye, but to trace the events of indefinite ages before the creation of our race, and is not even withheld from penetrating into the dark secrets of the ocean or the interior of the solid globe. And then he quotes Virgil to demonstrate this kind of uh, human power, imaginative power. So for Lyle, it was the imagination that might overcome the limitations of the mortal eye, as he puts it, the spatio-temporal insignificance of human beings in a geological time scale. So the drama of geology for Lyle was derived from the efforts of the human being to confront a world that both precedes and exceeds the species, to confront a world that is now operating at such a scale as to be almost invisible. It was this kind of imagination, Lyle argued, that would bring geology into the modern age. <coughs> So the specific shape given here to the 19th century geological imagination offers itself as an expression of a universal human power to transcend spatio-temporal limitations, but I don't think we should be surprised that it isn't, and that Lyle's human beings, um, the, the other geologists whose imaginations are working in early stage of advancement, testify to the fact that the geological imagination was both dependent on and productive of colonial habits of thought. And I want to argue give more detail about that, but also to argue that that colonial politics remains embedded at the heart of attempts to comprehend the scale of human significance in relation to the Earth. So, Noah Herringman, whose work, Romantic Rocks and Aesthetic Geology, and his more recent work um, on the Anthropocene, has cogently pointed out that the concept of the Anthropocene is indebted to late 18th, 19th century invention of what is now called deep time sometimes, but to other Enlightenment ideals too. So the idea of geology as a readable record, the great stone book that I talked about, or an archive into which humans might write themselves, and of course that myth of progress in which modern man is imagined as the kind of culmination of geological and anthropological time. These myths, Herringman argues, depend upon late 18th and early 19th century analogies between civil and natural history, uh, born of what he calls a radical scalar discontinuity. So his example of this is the way that um, early humans and early rocks are described in, early, in 18th and 19th century texts as primitive, despite the fact, and, and there's correlation, imagined kind of correlation between those two things, despite the fact that the earliest humans lived during comparatively recent geological periods and were never inhabitants of the period during which the so-called primitive rocks were formed. So, you know, the primitive rocks would be down here and the humans are up there, but they're both kind of given that term, primitive, um, and, and given characteristics that are the same, are kind of analogous. So Heroin notes the vertiginous temporal rush experienced by travellers like the young Charles Darwin on board the Beagle um, in the 1830s, as he, like many previous travellers, situated the savages of Tierra del Fuego amidst those primitive rocks, but simultaneously felt the exaggerated cultural distance between savages and moderns to vanish in the face of terrestrial antiquity. So now we're, you know, um, all human beings occupy a very small portion of time, so the distance that he, that he feels, this huge distance between him and the peoples that he encounters, but he also situates that in geological time and realises just in that time scale, the distance can't be as big as he thinks. For Herriman, this strategy of kind of correlating two kinds of primitive had a largely heuristic function, humanising inhuman time in a way that helped science to operate comparatively and on different scales. And in a different context, in my own work, I wasn't thinking about it in this way, but I have thought about the ways that the first geological maps in England, of its England and its counties, often created territories and borders, um, either in the strata or more geographical borders, um, according to aesthetically defined preferences for similarly metonymic relations between peoples and the rocks on which they lived. So you could group together primitive with uh, primitive rocks with indigenous peoples or with, you know, uh, people who fought against Roman invaders and, and invaders and conquerors with secondary rocks, more complex, more agglutinous, less pure. 
So as such, I think critics, including me, um, have largely focused on the heuristic function of such imaginings, positively valuing. I think in literature and science studies, we always want to say the imagination is really useful to scientists, and it always has been, and, you know, um, and the imagination is this great thing. Um, for its role in making millions of years of Earth history comprehensible in human terms. And I continue to agree that that's one of the things that it does. But here I want to think about it in a slightly different way, asking instead, how did the correlation of human and geological timescales also give seemingly natural structure to the regular dehumanisation of indigenous populations in ways that continue to be of relevance in this so-called Anthropocene epoch? To what extent was the seemingly benign, even productive imagination also the vehicle for more destructive modes of comprehending the relationship between humans and their environments? Um, in the 19th century geological imagination, it was modern man alone who had the power to range across seemingly unbridgeable chasms of time and space to absorb control and even produce the scalar discontinuity necessary to geological or later to evolutionary thinking. So I'm going to think about Darwin's Beagle Voyage now um, to begin with. So on this famous journey, Darwin travelled for five years, aged between 22 and 27, um, around the coast of South America to New Zealand, Australia and South Africa. I'm going to be thinking about his work in South America, particularly in Tierra del Fuego here. Um, on board, he read and absorbed, among other things, Lyle's Principles of Geology, which is handy for me, um, at least the first volume of Alexander von Humboldt's Personal Recollections, which had been given to him by a botanist in its translation by Moriah Williams, and John Milton's Paradise Lost. I've been thinking about those three texts. <clears throat> As Darwin wrote, in my excursions during the voyage of the Beagle, when I could take only a single volume, I always chose Milton. Um, and in an important reading of those experiences, Gillian Beer has argued that one of the things Darwin was most profoundly to learn as a result of the voyage was that the green control of the landscape with its many man-induced harmonies and sober beauties could not be considered normative. So the English landscape was not normative. Beyond England lay other natural landscapes full of tumultuous colour and life. So for Beer, the fecundity of the South American landscape disrupted the project of scientific collection. It made it hard, there's too much stuff to collect, there's too much, you know, um, it, it made it difficult taxonomically. And the imagery of creation in Paradise Lost, a voluptuously loving insistence upon the female nature of the earth, in every line a representation of superabundance, variety and plenty, gave Darwin the means to rejoice in the overturning of the anthropocentric view of the universe, which Milton emphasises. So Beer continues, Milton gave Darwin profound imaginative pleasure, which to Darwin was the means to understanding. So there again is that imagination is a route to knowledge. So Beer's work reveals the ways in which Darwin's reading of Thomas Malthus, who emphasised the scarcity of food resources, was reshaped in spirit and tone by this Miltonic sense of the fertility and generation of the natural world, of the power of both individuals and species to survive. So they don't, they don't just die, they also survive incredible circumstances. And her accounts of Darwin's literary reading have pioneered our current emphasis on the literary as of deep heuristic value to men of science confronted by new worlds they had no adequate language to explain. But I'm more interested here in her sense that Darwin overturns the anthropocentric view of the universe in Milton, <coughs> albeit using Milton's language as a resource. In many ways he did, but the poetic imagination in Darwin isn't always a joyous resource, and this hinges on precisely on his account of what it means to be human and how that might affect the way we understand the universe. So for a start, the world that he saw as he trekked into the South American landscape was not always a scene of hyperfertility. It was often, as he described it, a barren wasteland. So he says, um, I don't know, I don't have that one. Among the scenes which are deeply impressed on my mind, none exceed in sublimity the primeval forests undefaced by the hand of man, whether those of Brazil, where the powers of life are predominant, or those of Tierra del Fuego, where death and decay prevail. In both scenes, however, Brazil and Tierra del Fuego, it's the absence of the hand of man that makes its mark on his imagination, rather than fertility or not. <clears throat> Furthermore, it's precisely in this combination of both life and death, 
operating without human agency, that Darwin begins to question the significance of human life in shaping and being shaped by a world he now understood to have predated human existence by perhaps millions of years. So, as such, Ian Duncan has linked Darwin's response to wastelands to the text presentation of indigenous peoples. And I thought I had this, and I, oh yes I do, there it is. As Duncan puts it, the savage makes a rhetorical appearance as at once the antitype to rational computation and thus scientific knowledge, and as a type of the observer, Darwin himself, striving to reassert cognitive mastery in the face of an abysmal infinitude. Where the savage may fail, Darwin must succeed, since the savage also indexes the historical coordinates of this geological meditation in the scales of life sciences and human history. The extinction of animal species, which Darwin mentions, and the extinction of human populations, which he does not, but for which the baffled savage stands in. Both Beer and Duncan stress the importance of gaining cognitive mastery over a world that exceeds Darwin's linguistic resources. But Duncan's stress on the ways in which this attempt is set against the inability of the savage to do the same also marks the ways in which this inability is directly linked to the fate of the savage in nature. For Darwin, it is clear that indigenous peoples will inevitably become extinct in the face of competition from Europeans, precisely because they lack the rational computation to master the natural world, in part by describing it. As such, indigenous people stand in for, the, as Darwin puts it, the murky borders between nature and culture and between animal and man. But at the same time, as Duncan points out, the pleasure of the barren wastelands of Patagonia or the death and decay of the Tierra del Fuego forests or even of fertile Brazil underfaced by the hand of man was for Darwin the free scope it gave to the imagination, the free scope given to the imagination by these wildernesses. Not only is there no limit to their duration through future time, he writes, um, but precisely because they're not serviceable to mankind, these landscapes, he thinks they can't be made, they can't be cultivated, they operate as boundaries to man's knowledge. Earlier in the journal, he also writes about granite. Uh, so this is a, a, a Victorian uh, geological column, and granite, you can see, is imagined as the first rock, the earliest rock in the history of the Earth in that period. Um, and he imagines that too. He says that we generally see this as constituting the fundamental rock, and however formed as the deepest layer in the crust of the globe to which man has penetrated. The limit of man's um, knowledge in any subject possesses a high interest, Darwin writes, of granite, which is perhaps increased by its close neighbourhood to the realms of the imagination. So granite, like the barren plains of Patagonia, offers a tempting object for the man of science on which to exercise his imaginative prowess. <clears throat> Duncan describes this imagination as the enhanced cognitive range required to apprehend the vastly enlarged dimensions, the deep time of Lyle's new earth history. And in many ways, that's what it is. But of course, in Darwin's account, only certain kinds of people possess the imaginative range needed to comprehend different timescales, that of geological history and that of everyday human life. Um, as Darwin puts it, Darwin's reaction to these peoples announces the sublime, except that this time there is no imaginative recovery. Of course, there is imaginative recovery possible for Darwin, and it's made possible precisely by the existence of the indigenous peoples of South America. But that imaginative recovery is reconceived as the sole possession of the European heirs of the Enlightenment, and at the expense of those same indigenous peoples. Landscapes that are not useful to man are an affront to knowledge, and in being so, a spur to the free play of the imagination that will ultimately develop the human mind and occasion its historic progress. Um, and furthermore, this imagination is specifically facilitated, as Beer is suggested, by literary reading, by forms imagined as unavailable to the savage and offering new structures by which to interpret the relationship between humans and the earth. Um, so we have just a little look at Humboldt, too, now the Prussian naturalist whose travels in South America dramatise the ecological interconnectedness of the globe and shape perceptions of that continent for at least the next century. And Darwin took his book, or part of his book, um, on board the Beagle with him. Like Darwin after him, Humboldt also stresses the spur to imaginative response provided by the apparently humanless worlds he appears to encounter. As in many of Darwin's examples, there are no people in the spaces in which his imaginative flights occur. 
The human emptiness of the geologically conceived landscape not only helps overturn anthropocentric conceptions of the universe, it also effectively evacuates indigenous populations from the world under description. This human emptiness is achieved by zooming out to this geological scale of reference in which human beings appear insignificant, but it's also vocalised through the perceiving eye of the Western male observer. This manoeuvre removes the power of indigenous people to problematise this seemingly elemental encounter between man and world, enabling it to appear as a problem of consciousness. Equally importantly, in Williams' translation of Humboldt's personal narrative, which Darwin had with him, the prose is alive with the apparent da -da -da, uh, silence of the forest and foliage, to which she suggests we might lend an attentive ear. Nothing is better fitted, she proclaimed, Williams Humboldt proclaimed, to make the man feel the extent and power of organic life. Myriads of insects creep upon the soil and flutter around the plants, parched by the ardour of the sun. There are so many voices proclaiming to us that all nature breathes, and that under a thousand different forms, life is diffused throughout the cracked and dusty soil, as well as in the bosom of the waters and in the air that circulates around us. This particular passage is recalled by Darwin in an even more famous passage in Origin of Species, um, although he subjects these rhetorical strategies to a kind of series of reversals. But similarly, he places an emphasis on careful sensory attention to a world that seems one way. So this world, it seems like there's no life in it, but if you listen, you hear these myriad insects, these thousands of voices. And Darwin does the same thing, this kind of, there's life here, but you can't necessarily see it. Um, we and he turns it on its head somewhat. So he says, we behold the face of nature bright with gladness. <coughs> we often see superabundance of food, we do not see, or we forget, that the birds which are idly singing around us mostly live on insects or seeds and are thus constantly destroying life. Or we forget how largely these songsters or their eggs or their nestlings are destroyed by birds and beasts of prey. We do not always bear in mind that though food may now be superabundant, it is not so at all seasons of each repairing year. So what he has is not listening, but time. When you look at the earth, and you, or you hear the birds singing, or you look at birds in their nests, you don't... It, you don't think that this image of fecundity is actually underpinned by constant struggle. Um, so the eye is unreliable in both the Humboldt text and in Darwin, obscuring the powerful processes that propel generation in the natural world. It takes a special kind of seeing, imagining, or understanding to release the knowledge of it. In the personal narrative, we're given a vision of Humboldt overcoming this unreliable view of the natural world by listening. In the journal, Darwin does so by remembering, by bearing in mind things that we can't see. Elsewhere in Origin, drawing on his beagle experiences, Darwin explicitly relates and famously relates this forgetfulness to the comprehension of the savage. When we no longer look at an organic being as a savage looks at a ship, he writes, as something wholly beyond his comprehension, when we regard every production of nature as one which has had a history, how far more interesting, I speak from experience, will the study of natural history become? So this kind of imagination involves a repositioning of the natural object in both space and time. The organic being has a history invisible to the sensory eye, requiring restoration by the mind's eye of the imagination. And this imagination is defined specifically in contradistinction to the savage who does not or cannot possess it. <clears throat> as such, Darwin's imagination is built here not only by crossing the seasons of each occurring year or through the routine destruction of life constituting the long span of evolutionary history, but also across space, back to the shores of South America to remember the savage looking at a ship. This also happens in uh, Williams' uh, translation of the personal narrative. So we find here the impression of majestic tranquility, which the aspect of the firmament inspires in the solitary region. The tree under which we were seated, the luminous insects flying in the air, the constellations that shone toward the south, every object seemed to tell us that we were far from our native soil. If, amid this exotic nature, the bell of a cow or the roaring of a bull were heard from the depth of a valley, the remembrance of our country was awakened suddenly in the sound. They were like distant voices resounding from beyond the ocean and with magical power transporting us from one hemisphere to the other. Strange mobility of the imagination of man, eternal source of our enjoyments and our pains. So as sights give way to sounds, again in this passage, an uncanny familiarity sets in that emphasises both distance and proximity at once. I particularly like the 
cow, the tinkling of a cowbell and the roaring of a bull, which when they're written down, bull and bell sound very similar, but the tinkling and the roaring are antithetical in real life. So the tension, I think, produced by that disparity enacts that traveller's experience, which I'm sure many of us have felt traveling, I can, I can identify with it, of kind of being both at home and far away all at once, the, the moment that you suddenly feel reconnected with something from home. Um, but it culminates in this kind of, the a kind of assertion of the power of the mobility of the imagination of man to transcend both sound and sight, transcend sensory experience. So what we see in here are not trustworthy in either the journal or the personal narrative. Instead, the senses are replaced by a power to range across hemispheres and millennia um, to achieve imaginative transcendence over time and space. And I think you can feel there how that is still registered as the token of an enlightened mind or the seasoned traveller or his vicarious reader. That's true for Lars' Principles of Geology, too, in book in which the imagination occasionally takes centre stage and which was critical reading for Darwin on the Beagle um, and refined his own geological practice. As already outlined, Lyle's emphasis throughout much of the principles is on the radical instability of human interpretations of the rock record. But his answer to this displacement of the human being from the world in which he lives is the, in the existence of this transcendent human imagination. He says, as by studying the external configuration of the existing land and its inhabitants, we may restore in imagination the appearance of the ancient continents which have passed away. So we may obtain from the deposits of ancient seas and lakes an insight into the nature of the subaqueous processes now in operation and many forms of organic life which, though now existing, are veiled from our sight. Rocks also produced by subterranean fire in former ages at great depths in the bowels of the earth present us when upraised by gradual movements and exposed to the light of heaven with an image of those changes which the deep-seated volcano may now occasion in the nether regions. So like Darwin or Humboldt and Williams, Lyle reaches through the veils of sight to a transformative kind of vision that collapses spatio-temporal distinctions. The imagination restores lost continents from the past by comparing them to those now existing, Present processes lost to our sight because underground are revealed to that same imagination by reconciling them with the evidence for past processes that are now physically moved into view. Um, physical proximity and temporal presence are collapsed as they were in the personal narrative as we move in stages from the inward looking insight to the apprehension of the invisible in veiled from our sight to the visionary seeing by the light of heaven. Lyle relies upon a similar commingling of multi-sensory experiences until they transform into visionary perspectives able to illuminate obscure geological objects by the light of millions of years of geological history or thousands of miles of space, some of it underground. Again, and this is part of this passage, this is explicitly conceived as a power, Lyle writes, which accompanies the growing intelligence of every people and is unavailable to humans in an early stage of advancement. Um, I'm aware that I'm sort of running out, that I'm, I'm going to go over time, so I'm going to skip over something. I did want to talk just briefly about this passage and bring Milton there. I will I'll, I will talk about it very briefly here. Um, so in the second volume of Principles, Lyle actually spends a long time thinking about evolution and rejecting it. Instead, he says, there are these foci of creation across the earth, little points across the earth where new creation happens, um, and, and that is introduced by, by um, a kind of supernatural mechanism, um, or some kind of mechanism that he can't explain. Um, so he, he, he says that, um, so he's, as part of this, he thinks about the ways in which insects, uh, he's, well, the, it, people could argue that insects kind of are a place where you might look for evolutionary change, and he says no, because yes, insects kind of suddenly multiply um, and seem to change form and numbers really rapidly at different points in Earth history. But he says they're only doing that as part of the Earth's check and balances. So when one species becomes dominant, suddenly you'll get an influx of all these uh, insects, they'll kill off that dominant species. And when order is restored, the insects vanish again. And he compares them to, he uses Milton to think about that. So he says the swarming myriads depart, this is the swarming myriads of um, insects, which may have covered the vegetation like the aphids or darkened the air like locusts. In almost every season there are some species which in this manner put forth their strength, and then, like Milton's spirits which throng the spacious hall, reduce to smallest forms their shapes immense. 
So thick the airy prow, swarmed and was straightened, till the signal given behold a wonder. They but now who seemed in bigness to surpass Earth's giant sons, now less than smallest dwarfs. So Lyle likens Athens to locusts in order further to kind of draw on his biblical language, but also the extract he cites from Milton here is from Book One of Paradise Lost, in which the devils build pandemonium. So he's drawing partly on the kind of image of Satan as Beelzebub, or Lord of the Flies, and devils as insects, but he reinterprets this Miltonic passage to naturalistic advantage. Having constructed their seat of power in Paradise Lost, the devils then have to shrink to fit inside it. And they all do that except Satan, who remains, he keeps his immense form, but nonetheless manages to sit inside a building that's technically too small to contain him. Um, so it's all about kind of shifting scale. Lyle deploys Milton's poetry not to suggest unlimited fecundity or the creative power of the earth, but rather to suggest the power of nature to shapeshift, for the powers of life both to multiply and then to retract as is required of them by an ecosystem in balance. So like Satan's powers, the powers of nature to change form and scale seem limitless, but also like Satan's powers, they turn out to have quite a fixed range to be set within fixed moral and physical parameters. So nature can do extraordinary things, Lyle implies, but evolution is one thing too far. So Milton helps Lyle give form to the simultaneous power and limitations of natural forces, deploying poetry as an agent of the imagination, the kind of imagination that can expand and contract to cross space and time at will, and the imagination as a kind of metaphor or proxy for nature itself, because nature possesses too just these powers to expand and contract as is required of it. So in the journal of researchers and more widely, Darwin famously argued for monogenesis, the idea that all human beings belong to one species regardless of race, or rather that races were not separate species. Joining in the arguments for the human race as one species, a universal category, he also deploys the imagination as an instance of that universal power to comprehend what makes humans human. And yet what emerges most strongly is that it takes an act of imagination to see humans as one species, because to him, the appearance of indigenous peoples, particularly the inhabitants of Tierra del Fuego, is so shocking. As he famously put it, viewing such men, one can hardly make oneself believe that they are fellow creatures and inhabitants of the same world. So it's presented as an index of Darwin's imaginative superiority that he can surmount the, um, what's the quotation, I'll just leave that, um, that he can surmount the hideous faces, stunted growth, discordant voices and violent gestures he describes as being presented to his eyes and ears by these people and can keep in mind their sameness. He says it's really, really hard, but I managed it. I managed even in the face of the vastest difference between my human difference, I can imagine, to keep remembering that we are the same species. Naked, they weren't naked, he thought they were naked. In a tempestuous climate, they sleep on the wet ground, coiled up like animals, he writes, picking shellfish from low waters, supplementing their diets with a few tasteless berries and fungi, the odd seal or the floating carcass of a putrid whale. Lacking the imagination, the foresight and knowledge to plan around the immediate provisions of the scarcely resourced natural world in which they live, Darwin presents them as at the mercy of nature's caprice. Furthermore, their social organisation is presented as a function of the meagerness of the land in which they live. Chiefless, hostile tribes separated from each other only by a deserted border or neutral territory. Their country is a broken mass of wild rocks, lofty hills and useless forests. This broken mass of rocks and hills literally breaks down social and, the social and domestic organisation of human life. He says, because of this landscape, the people there are forced to wander from spot to spot looking for food, debarred from cliffs by their steepness. They cannot know the feeling of having a home, Darwin writes, and still less of that of domestic affection, for the husband is to the wife a, as brutal a master as to a laborious slave. Um, here, useless forests, for him, they're a spur to the imagination. These useless forests where nothing happens are the, are the seed in which he can exercise this imaginative force. For these people, then, they're a hindrance to the very existence of an imagination. How little, Darwin writes, can the higher powers of mind be brought into play? What is there here for imagination to picture, for reason to compare, for judgment to decide upon? To knock a limpet from the rock does not even require cunning, that lowest power of the mind. Their skill, in some respects, may be compared to the instinct of animals, for it is not improved by experience. 
Picturing, comparing, decision making, these are powers that indicate the presence of the higher mind produced by a landscape that permits both physical and imaginative cultivation. At the same time, in a curiously circular logic, cultivation is only possible once those higher powers of mind are in place. So while Darwin is able to enjoy the free scope given to the imagination by granite or forests not serviceable to mankind, the Fijians, dependent on those rocks and forests for their very existence, do not have the luxury of such contemplation. The power or otherwise of human beings, Fijians or Europeans, to inscribe themselves on the landscape in the kinds of ways currently being conceptualised by geolog geologists of the Anthropocene is therefore a serious issue for Darwin as he attempts to define the nature of the human in this text. This goes beyond the Fijians' lack of agricultural organisation as he sees it. Darwin was an inheritor of late 18th century ideas about the shaping of cultures by climate, the idea that forest clearing and cultivation in North America would make the climate more temperate and more suitable for European inhabitations. There was an argument that if you clear the forest, you make the climate kind of more like a European climate. Um, but his work was also shaped by Lyell, who argued that the Earth's climate was produced by the gradual redistribution of land across its surface. If you have more land near the equator, the uh, Earth would be hotter. If you have more land as it moves around near the poles, you'd have a colder Earth. In this scheme, human beings had relatively little impact on the climate of the globe since they hadn't occupied it long enough to produce any changes. So when Darwin considers what he calls the puzzle of Indian archaeological remains in northern Chile, including advanced architecture, tunnel boring, and arrowheads of precisely the same figure with those now used in Tierra del Fuego, he is stumped. So he says, the remains are found at heights so great as to almost be border on the perpetual snow, where no passes exist, where the land produces nothing, and there's no water. How could Indians, without iron, without gunpowder, have survived this inhospitable land, even made it cultivatable? He ponders the possibility that the continent has been gradually elevated since the epoch of existing shells, transforming the climate and making it more arid, so that when the Indians lived there, it was more cultivatable and the earth has changed since then. But this means he needs to make the Indians have lived for a much greater span of time than he's willing to give human beings at this point. Um, so that doesn't work. So then he says, he has a discussion with an engineer and he says, oh, maybe um, this land, now incapable of cultivation, was reduced to this state by the water conduits that the Indians constructed. So they destroyed the land and made it uncultivatable. Um, so in this account, they don't have to be situated within a deep geological past, but they do have to be credited with the power to transform the land, even the climate, in ways far exceeding that of the Fijians, who he says have inherited their tools. So Darwin argues that humans are of great geological antiquity one moment, then he retreats, locates the Indian in the recent past, but endowing him with a power over the landscape that belies his status as a primitive man. Uh, he tends towards the latter explanation as the most likely, but he leaves both options on the table. He can't decide which one to go with. Instead, he shifts focus using that scalar discontinuity that I talked about earlier, linking primitive, two different kinds of primitive. <laughs> Professing another kind of shock akin to that reaction to the Fijians, he simply begins to correlate human and geological timescales by means more metaphorical than genealogical. genealogical. It's impossible to reflect, he says, on the changed state of the American continent without the deepest astonishment. Formerly, it must have swarmed with great monsters. Now, we find mere pygmies compared with the antecedent allied races. If Buffon had known of the gigantic sloth and armadillo-like animals and the lost Pachydermata, he might have said with the greatest semblance of truth that the creative force in America had lost its power rather than that it had never possessed great vigour. So now he's in a land in which the creative force has lost its power. Everything in this land, including the great monsters of deep geological time and the humans who've had inhabited it in the much more recent past, are kind of pygmy-like versions of their former selves. The Tierra del Fuegans appear as the unenlightened ancestors of European man belonging to the deep evolutionary past. They also appear before Darwin in the present as the pygmy-like dwindled primitive descendants rather than ancestors of a powerful Indian race whose relics continue to mark the landscape after millennia. So at least three different narratives shape Darwin's perception of the Fijians. As such, the imagination in Darwin is touted as bestowing a universalising power to reconnect these multiple races in a shared story of humanity, transcending time and space, allowing one to make oneself believe the incomprehensible. 
to see the Fijian as a human, as a mark of your enlightened imagination. Um, but being a Fijian is to be subject to the forces of nature, without narrative power, no sense of the future life, no sense of history, no ability to change or learn from experience, or to transport oneself imaginatively or even physically across landscapes to make comparisons. To be a Fijian is to stand in as both ancestor and descendant of civilization, but not to shape it. It is to be a human on the brink of extinction, driven out by superior races. It is also to be an analogy for the megatheria, already extinct, emblematic of a continent whose creative force has been lost repeatedly over untold millennia, and all at once again now. I'm going to finish up now. Um, so as Herriman hints, Darwin's correlation, of, and I'm going to finish up by returning to the present a little bit where I'm not on safe ground, so I'll try it. Um, Darwin's correlation of both human and geological timescales, not unique to him, of course, but powerfully expressed in the journal, has radical racial consequences with which we continue to grapple. Critics of the Anthropocene point out that, quote, the complex and paradoxical experiences of diverse people as humans in the world, including the ongoing damage of colonial and imperialist agendas, can be lost when the narrative is collapsed to a universalizing species paradigm. Not all humans are equally implicated in the forces that created the disasters driving contemporary human environmental crises, and not all humans are equally invited into the conceptual spaces where these disasters are theorized or responses to disaster formulated. Marx's challenges to the idea of the Anthropocene argue that capital accumulation and those societies built upon it are responsible for the Anthropocene rather than that pollution and environmental wreckage are an inescapable feature of human psychology. If, quote, human flourishing depends on our rallying around a common narrative of what it means to be human, a planetary one humanity narrative, that narrative can also be made to imply that early humans were characterised by their power to adapt to climate change, or even that intellectual advance had been repeatedly linked to great shifts in the Earth's climatic conditions. So there are people saying this, this sixth extinction event might be an opportunity for evolutionary advancement. Like, yes, lots of people will die, but the survivors will do great things. Non-white people of multiple cultures, geographical locations and social organisations are often written out of the narrative entirely. So it's significant then that um, while for Darwin and his readers it may have been deeply troubling to assert the identity of the human as a single, exclusively biological species, from another perspective it wasn't troubling at all. Tim Ingall points out a paradox at the heart of Western thought which insists with equal assurance both that humans are animals and that animality is the very obverse of humanity. But for anthropologists of the Fijians, or rather of the Yegan or Yamana people of Tierra del Fuego, this aporia does not provide a secure basis for considering how Fijians themselves conceived of their relationships with the non-human species on which they rely. That's Penelope Dransart, um, uh, uh, an anthropologist of the Yegan people. Indeed, it is likely, she writes, that Fijians did not give special status to human beings as persons against the other species of their environment. Darwin's imaginative struggle to reconceive of the relationships between human beings, biological species and geological chain was emphatically not a struggle that the peoples he encountered would have recognised in quite those terms. Indeed, reading Darwin's construction as a geological imagination alongside anthropological histories of the alien culture might offer a means of restaging the particular forms of Darwin's ideas about interspecies relationships and might reveal the unacknowledged significance of Jaeger imaginings of the Earth and its species in Darwin's thought. Ironically, of course, the very existence of imagination among Jaeger people was unthinkable to Darwin as he conceived of the Earth and of species at geological and planetary scales. The particular shape and scale of his imaginings made the thinking of evolution possible, but made him blind to the existence of other forms of imagination. Nonetheless, of course, Darwin was wrong, just as he was wrong in seeing Jaeger people who were dressed in oiled skins, furs and beards as naked. Beads, as naked. Anthropological evidence suggests that Jaeger hunting required multi-species cooperation of a peculiarly imaginative kind, in fact. Jaeger hunters not only harpooned whales isolated by orcas, esteeming their co-predators as sacred, but during initiation ceremonies, children played the part of vulnerable seals on the shoreline while community elders reenacted the role of the orcas that would hunt them. From that position of vulnerability, Dransart writes, imaginatively inhabiting the bodies of the animals with whom they coexisted, whom they would hunt and co-hunt with, 
young Jaeger people acquired the skills to dress and feed themselves as adults. Growing up Jaeger meant both imaginatively and literally wearing fur and oil, entering into the skin of non-human others. It required a fundamentally imaginative engagement with the Earth and its species of a wholly different order and at a wholly different spatio-temporal scale than was visible to the enlightened geological imagination possessed by Darwin. Questions abound, and I don't have answers. But to what extent did the vast scales at which the geological imagination was required to operate render invisible, insignificant, or unimportant other scales of imagining which might have had equally profound consequences for evolutionary thinking? To what extent did Darwin's blindness to the highly skilled, imaginative and cross-species practices of hunting prevalent in the Indian culture contribute to his sense of interspecies relationships as inherently conflictual and competitive rather than cooperative? To what extent are supposedly new understandings of interspecies cooperation, of animal agency, or particularly of the human embeddedness in earth processes implied by the Anthropocene, simply resurfacings of powerful imaginative traditions whose existence was rendered invisible by and yet crucial to the construction of Western accounts of Earth history. Reading Darwin's journal of researches and the texts with which it engaged reminds us, in fact, that the history of the idea of geological time is bound up with the claim that it takes an act of imagination to see humans as one species, a colonial intellectual history that seems lost or forgotten in many of today's Anthropocene discourses, but is still, I think, rumbling in the background. As such, the so-called planetary turn in which the humanities is now said to be engaged, I don't know, there are a lot of turns in which we're engaged, but I'm just focusing on that one, uh, re-energising the long effort to think in scales both planetary and geological has a history stemming at least from the Enlightenment. It's important, I think, to acknowledge that history, and in doing so, it's crucial that we not forget that other scales of imagining, human-human, human-animal, intercultural and interspecies forms of imagining, are easily lost at the planetary and geological scale. Such scales of imagining are nonetheless equally crucial if we're really to reshape the destiny of the Earth and the species and peoples who live within it. That feels like a very pompous ending, I might have to change that. <laughs> anyway, that's it.